Grace and peace to you, United Church, and welcome to Worship This Sunday. I'm recording this from the Devonvale Golf Course, and it's Thursday afternoon. Many of our golfers are out there on the course. The ladies played this morning, and uh, they're fighting the wind out there. I can see it's quite a strong wind. Many of those who played this morning played in a lighter wind. But thank you to everyone who's been involved, both those who've played today and been involved in the actual day, those who've made donations, and uh, some donated very valuable things to be auctioned off this evening at the dinner. So uh, we'd like to give a special thanks to Brian Shepherd and Mark Philp and Carol and Berta and Sanel and all of those who've been involved in making this all possible. Uh, to all of those who sat at the tables, uh, Stisha and Sasha, and who have been part of the staff of making this golf day, golf day possible. So a very big thank you from United Church to all of you who've been involved, to those who've come who are not directly part of our church to support the work that we're able to do both in the Stellenbosch city center of town area and also in the Kaimandu chapel area. So as we come to worship this Sunday and as we look at advice you might give your younger self is uh, the topic of today's sermon. I want you to join me in prayer as we give thanks. Holy Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for this wonderful town where people are so supportive of the work that you have called us to do in this place. We pray for all those who will struggle in this week. We pray for your hand to be upon them, uh, for Pam and Claire and uh, several others who will be recovering from surgery. We pray, Father, for all of those who haven't been able to get to worship for a long, long time. For those who will watch this video, may your hand be upon them and let them know that they are part of a great fellowship, a great cloud of witnesses. And may we know your love and grace as we share together. So open our, the eyes of our hearts that we may see Jesus and know his spirit in us. For we ask it in his name. Amen. Second Samuel chapter 23 verses 1 to 7. These are the last words of David. The inspired utterance of David son of Jesse, the utterance of the man exalted by the Most High, the man appointed by the God of Jacob, the hero of Israel's songs. The Spirit of the Lord spoke through me. His word was on my tongue. The God of Israel spoke. The Rock of Israel said to me, When one rules over people in righteousness, when he rules in the fear of God, he is like the light of morning at sunrise on a cloudless morning, like the brightness after rain that brings grass from the earth. If my house were not right with God, surely he would not have made with me an everlasting covenant, arranged and secured in every part. Surely he would not bring to fruition my salvation and grant me my every desire. But evil men are all to be cast aside like thorns, which are not gathered with a hand. Whoever touches thorns uses a tool of iron or the shaft of a spear. They are burned up where they lie. United Church, we spoke last week about this need to immerse our children in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, looking at the, the idea of baptism in Jesus' great commission in Matthew 28 and verse 18, rather than as an instruction about water baptism in any sort of detail, than rather a, a, an instruction about immersing our children or those who are baptized in who God is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Everything about this God of love who gave it all for us, about the Son who sacrificed himself for others, and about the Spirit who empowers, and immersing our children in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And if we are to, to truly believe in baptizing infants, then it's got to be about more than the water, but a an immersion in a society, in a, in a family 
that truly believes and practices God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Last, um, last night I got a WhatsApp from my sister who lives in Australia who sent me this very quick one-liner just saying, I miss dad with this little teary face uh, emoji. And I got it and I thought, where does this come from? It's out of the blue. It's on some arbitrary day. It's not, you know, my dad's birthday or the day he died. It, it's just in the middle of nowhere. And she's, so I said to her, where does it come from? Because, you know, I miss dad at points too. And uh, she said they'd just been sitting outside having a glass of wine, talking about family, and, and she'd remember it. So, so I shared with her a holiday memory I had, and um, my dad always used to wear this terrible brown striped shirt, you know, one of those dad shirts, and we always tried to take it away from him, but he insisted on wearing it at our birthday. So we had a birthday party, he'd wear that shirt, and we hated it. Um, I had a bad relationship with my dad, just a whole bunch of things, and uh, it took a long time for me to begin to heal from the wounds that were there and from the difficulties that we had experienced in our father-son relationship. And I blame my dad for many, many years. But it was probably in the last two decades that I really began to sense, feel that my dad had had this huge impact on my life and share and remember the time, the fact that my dad came from a place of brokenness. His family was broken, his dad, his dad was an alcoholic and um, there were moments when he had to defend his mother from his father. And as the eldest son, he just bore a huge responsibility for having to look after his brothers. And he didn't finish the trick because he had to go and go off to army and go to work. And uh, he just had a tough life having to study through correspondence. But when my dad retired, he retired from the Durban municipality as the assistant city treasurer, one of the highest positions in the Durban municipality. And uh, he was one of the leaders of the Institute of Municipal Accountants in South Africa. He he'd done so well for himself, and yet he had to work very hard. And part of that working hard was he didn't have much time for his family. So looking back at my dad's life and the impact he had on me just taught me something about about who I am and how far the Lord has brought me in terms of growth and sharing these moments with my sister was just a just a great moment of remembering dad um, and the good things his smell this, this shirt the holidays the good things times we had with him now David at the end of his life has this moment with his son Solomon and of all the things he could have done with Solomon all the things he could have taught him in terms of dignity and um, being a man, being a leader, he gets himself up on one shoulder, one elbow as it were, on his deathbed and everyone knows he's frail and ill and he says to his son, my son Solomon, you know this man, this particular man, you know how he treated me, he did not support me in my work. Now you go down and you kill that man. You know when you read the story that follows on from this great hymn of praise, we find David just descending into, into degrees of, of hatred and vengeance which just belie this wonderful psalm we read about David. We find in David somebody who began his life as a leader with very little recognition apart from the fact that he'd been able to kill a bear and a lion with his bare hands. Sure, he's protecting his sheep, but his life and leadership begins in, in violence. And then the very first act with Israel and her army was to kill the Philistine leader. Sure, he's threatening Israel, but you can see how this man's beginnings of his leadership are in, in blood. Then one of the stories of David is that he commits adultery with Bathsheba. And in the process of doing this, he, he sets himself up for for a, a mutiny or for a civil war because it is the wife of one of his generals who he then puts in the front lines of battles and so while he's in the bath with Bathsheba he he sends her husband out to die in battle. What makes this man a great king? Now there are a few things that I think we can learn from David where he is now about his deathbed uh, conversation with his son Solomon. And I want to look at this a little bit in the terms of the framework that we've discovered of the parables, which is that the parables teaching about God's tr true kingdom, the kingdom which, which David's life anticipated, the true and good kingdom, the kingdom of self-sacrifice, 
um, there were three essential things about the kingdom of Jesus which David should have embodied, but somehow we have to search hard to find these things. The first is that this kingdom is eternal. It's not just about one lifetime. It's not just about accomplishing what I ought to accomplish in my lifetime, but actually setting things up so that after I go, there would be a continuity of God's grace and goodness in Jesus' ministry in the life of those around me. This eternal kingdom for which we live. It's not a short game, it's a long game. And so we live to make the world this better place in Christ Jesus and through his spirit. And the second thing is that the kingdom of God is inclusive. It, it does not say it's us and them. It doesn't say it's me against the world, but it is, I am here to bless the world. That is what inclusivity is about. It is about saying that the, the grace which I've received from Christ is a grace which I give to the world. As um, Paul the Apostle says to Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. Your job is to take the good news of Christ Jesus to the world. It's not to keep it for yourself, but to take it to every single person uh, without fear of what the consequences may be. And the third thing is that we're there to serve, that the intention of God is that what he gives us is to be given away to others. Um, and it's to be given away to others at cost to our souls. Uh, do the hard work, um, Paul the Apostle says to Timothy. Now, um, in the book of Hebrews, we're told we have a great cloud of witnesses around us and uh, that we should run the race um, set out before us because of this great cloud of witnesses. And uh, sometimes when we, when we look at the great heroes of faith, we look at someone like David and we say, you know, how is he such a great example? Is he part of the great cloud of witnesses? And how, what does this example mean? You know, these witnesses, what are they witnessing to? And are they an example to us? And it's important to understand that one of the things about this great cloud of witnesses is firstly, they're dead. <laughs> they are called martyrs in the, the book of Hebrews. This great cloud of witnesses are the martyrs, those who have died and gone before us into heaven. Their life is run. And we have a great cloud of witnesses who have died, in this case, for their faith. And what they prove to us is the value of our faith and primarily the truth and power of the resurrection. These people would not have died if they did not believe and know that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. For these are the first centuries, the first Christians. But the, the thing about these people who have gone on ahead of us is that what happens at the end of our life, how we die, how we move on and go on to become one of these witnesses, in a sense, martyrs, um, writes the script of others' lives. And this is the key that I want us to, to get today. The way that David said goodbye to Solomon wrote the script for, David, for Solomon's life. The words that we give to others, the way we instruct those who come after us as people facing the end of our lives, writes the script, the story of their lives. And it is so important that we get this right in our old age, the way we speak to our children. And uh, we, the, the things we feel passionate about at, at that age of our lives, at that stage of our lives, can often tend to narrow our world down and to make us think only of ourselves. Now, some of the, some of the greatest activists have been elderly people. If we look at our own President Nelson Mandela, who is a, a great acti activist, and some of his, his most powerful work of reconciliation in our country was done at a very old age. He was personally invested in this as um, part of his life. And so he, he wrote, in a sense, a script for our country, uh, restraining what might have gone horribly, horribly wrong. But one friend of mine once said, said to me quite recently, that it's not the over 40s who are going to save this world. And one of the problems with the over 40s is that we, we realize that we're going to, the, the world is going to outlive us. If we don't save the planet, well, it's kind of okay because we'll die before the planet does. But what about the next generation? The, the most um, aggressive activists are those under 40 for climate change, for, um, for overpopulation, uh, for water issues, for land issues, because they realize that in their lifetime it could impact them negatively. 
But one of the things I've noticed recently is some of the most the most aggressive campaigners for the rights of people with alternate gender um, orientation or sexual orientation, um, so-called alternate sexual orientation, of those well over 40, those for whom their whole life has been impacted by prejudice of others, and they, they are campaigning for something that is really near and dear to them. It is so important that we as Christians campaign for the, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, which is so near to us with those who come after us. Um, so Ian McKellen, one of those campaigners I was speaking about, um, the actor who played Gandalf in Lord of the Rings, said of the said to the youngsters of their parents, and I, this is something for the youngsters. So we're speaking about the end of life and how we as children and parents should deal with that point in our lives. So Ian McKellen said to the Oxford Union, a group of Ox, Oxons, Oxford um, students, in a society meeting, he said to them, take advantage of your parents while they're alive. M many of us only hear the stories of our parents when they die. But it is so important that we, as children, find out about our parents, learn their stories, hear their stories, learn from their stories. The, the continuity of the improvement of society in our world depends on us taking up the baton from our parents, learning from them and what they've done and, and achieved in terms of changing the world around them. And you as parents, us as older people who are the over 40s, we need to tell our stories to our kids. And, and it's so important that we not only tell the good about our stories, but the not so good. Now, the power of David's story for us is that we get to read the story of a man who lived in the grace of God, who understood what it means meant to receive the forgiveness of God when he prayed in Psalm 51, do not take your spirit from me, who saw the mess of the seams of his life ripped apart as his son died um, out after his adultery with Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah. He, he experienced what it meant to have his life ripped apart and what he could have shared with Solomon. We have the benefit of knowing it. What he could have shared with Solomon is what um, Miriam Margolis, one, one of the controversial actors from England, uh, recently said. If she could give advice to her 15-year-old self, she would say, adultery is stupid. Don't do it. You are gambling with your and your family's happiness. Now, imagine if David could simply have given his son that advice. Instead, he gave some, uh, some sort of general, nefarious kind of idea of obey the law of God. Yeah, obey the law of God, but don't disobey it because it's stupid. Now, I think that we could learn so much more if we were just frank and honest with one another. If we understood that, that we can't package our lives up in a neat package and think of the entire ribbon on and say, hey, my life wasn't bad, as David tries to do in the psalm we read today. But instead, if we were brutally honest about the wrong things we'd done and shared with our kids how we'd broken things and just allowed them to see the damage that it can cause when we stray from what is good and respectful and dignifying to others. Give our, if we were able to give our children the blessing of the lessons we've learned, but instead we, we, we try and ring fence them, hold them in with general language, we try and stop them from making the mistakes we made without telling them the brokenness of that came from the make mistakes we've made. And so here's David in this moment of self-praise. Um, he, in a sense, compares himself to the wicked. And we can always find somebody worse than us. But immediately after saying, I'm better than them, he goes off and counts as fighting men. He issues these directives of vengeance to his son. But if we as parents... Uh, we're able to speak good news into our children by showing them the brokenness and the redemption, by speaking to our children and saying, I've been through this, I've been there, I've seen it, but I've received grace. I've known what it is to move past it. As I've known what it is to be repaired, restored in my love for my father, even after he died, and be restored in my love for my sisters and for my family. 
just to know what it is to see brokenness and yet be redeemed. These are the stories we need to be telling our children. Understanding that if we pass this on to our children, we so be much better equip them to see the world as it truly is, rather than with rose-colored sunglasses and allow them to trip and make their own mistake. But the, the second thing we need to help our children with is that we are not better than others. Nothing about us makes us better than others. We are humans and we are all filled and, and, and affected by that same brokenness the Bible calls sin. And when we begin to understand that, we begin to teach our children to, to live lives of inclusivity, to bring good news regardless of where it puts us, to teach others that they are completely and utterly loved by God, rather than this us and, us and them mentality of what David brought to Solomon, so that the sword did not depart from David's house, even as God had said to him, since he lived by the sword, his family would d die by the sword. So we have this sense that passing on the brokenness and the redemption, this forgiveness which we have experienced in our lives to our children, helps them in the long game so that they can build on the back of our experience of God's grace. But secondly, that we will help our children to understand that they stand in grace and they are not better like David seems to think he is than others. And then the third thing we can learn is that our life is not about putting their things right um, for ourselves. It's not about tidying up the mess ourselves, but it is about allowing Jesus to tidy up the mess as we dirty our hands with it, as we allow ourselves to become involved with this world and to minister grace into it. Um, when Jesus says, sends us into the world to immerse the world in the love of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he sends us into the world not to make converts, but to make disciples. And discipleship is a place where we, we love the broken. We love the sinner and the tax collector, the one who was rejected by society. We, we love those who would betray Jesus as Jesus did in Judas Iscariot. We love those who would be hot-headed and try and wreck everything about the ministry we think is ours. We love all of those. So the question for that I want us to ask today is what advice would we give on our deathbed? Will we turn to our children um, and give them some sort of general advice as to what they might do in the future, whether it's saving the planet, recycling, or maybe just caring for and loving their children or avoiding some or other thing? Or will we tell them, as Miriam Margolis said, adultery is stupid, don't do it, because I've experienced the path that I might go down or did go down in this. Murder will kill you if you seek your own with the life of others. The, the sword will not depart from your house. Discrimination ultimately will come home. If you keep others at bay, it will come home to roost. Or will you say to them, be the grown up, be the grown up. Many of us miss out on our relationship with our parents because we won't grow up and just ask them for a relationship. Try and be as close as they can and say to them, it's okay, it's okay, and love them. So will we tell our children, you know what, you're okay, you've done well, wherever you are in life, you are loved, deeply loved by me, you're loved by God, and you're okay. We have an immense privilege as people over 40 so often I'm misquoted. You know, people will come to me and say, remember this sermon when you preached da 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 And I was like, I, mean, I never preached that sermon. It wasn't me. I know it was one of my colleagues. And yet I'm blamed for the grace that they've heard. I love that. We, we speak into people's lives constantly. And what are you going to speak into somebody's life? Uh, are you going to speak a, a negativity that crushes them? Or are you going to do what Paul says in the book of Colossians? Let your speech be seasoned with grace as you speak to others. Let us speak into others' lives what life is really about and how we've experienced the grace of God in our lives. For that is the good news. And as youngsters, 
Listen, take advantage of your parents who are still alive. Find out their stories, learn from it, and speak grace into their lives. So may we be a people who will bring words of life to others, like David on his deathbed, but words of life, speaking good news and blessing into the lives of others. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this word from the scriptures, a word which punches us between the eyes. It may be contradictory to something we've heard before about David, but it is so true of us as humans. We want to tidy up the mess ourselves instead of getting our hands bloodied in the mess as Jesus did and allowing you, Lord Jesus, to fix it, to make it right with your love and your grace and your acceptance. And so may we share words of life with our children. May we, in a sense, demand words of life from our parents. May we live a life which includes others and brings them into a fellowship with Jesus. And may we serve others, even if it costs us, by being the grown-up and choosing to have a relationship, even with those who may not want a relationship with us. So, Father, may we be agents of grace in this world, making disciples of it and immersing this world in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. For we ask it in your precious name. Amen. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.